that man a chancellor? I'll make him a postmaster and you can lick stamps with my head on it. Hey folks, today we are going to look at some republics, but not healthy and functional ones, but ones that didn't go so well for one reason or another. This has happened many times throughout history and doesn't follow the same pattern as large empires built by one person a generation, whose fall generally comes from a lack of succession and infighting in civil war. Though, we will get to that later. For this piece, we will be looking at two democratic states, the Roman Republic and everybody's favorite when talking about how not to go about having your democracy, the Weimar Republic. Now to show you how to literally elect Hitler to power. The Weimar Republic was established on the 9th of November 1918 following the November Revolutions, thus ending the monarchy which had stands since Prussian times. This wasn't as hard as a transition as you'd think as the previous government had had some semblance of a parliament. Also the aristocracy more or less fled the country and left them to their fate, so no help from them there. Not that Wilhelm II would have been good for much, as the government was more of a military dictatorship under like Ludendorff and Hindenburg in the last years of war. For Austria, which had been a monarchy for hundreds of years, this wasn't the case, and they coped with it poorly, but they survived. Wait a second, I lied. They didn't. Everything in Germany was in sunshine and rainbows as a new country was bent over a barrel at Versailles and assassinations were fairly common from the start, including the man who had to sign the treaty at the former. They were able to get the economy going again, which helped for a while and repair relations with the international community, as they had a competent leadership in the early years which I would like to go on into to highlight the honeymoon period of this republic. Enter Gustav Streisemann, a statesman that ranks up in Bismarck, in my opinion, of getting shit done. A right-winger with Graves disease, you know, the one that makes your eyes bug out and kills you, who used to be a monarchist, who changed his mind after realizing that it was a true republic or anarchy for Germany. We'll get to that later. He eventually started out as chancellor, but went on to become foreign minister. Did I mention that most chancellors only remain chancellor for about a year or so? This made it hard to get things done as a new guy was in place like that and probably didn't agree with the previous's opinion. Anyway, he reopened up relations with France and then got the Rhineland unoccupied and begrudgingly agreed to the post-war borders, except for Poland. What could possibly go wrong there? He was also very fond of using the military or paramilitaries whenever ruckus started up, which were there were many in this new state. Speaking of the leader of the armed forces, let's talk about his partner in crime, Friedrich Ebert. The first president of the Weimar Republic was a big proponent of Bergenfrieden's politik during the war, and was elected president upon the first election in February 1919. Though a righteous man for Republican ideal, his position had a little bit too much power. The president was allowed to pick his chancellor and his cabinet, his standard, had full control over the army, and could enact Article 48, which was a trump card, which allowed emergency decrees bypassing parliament, similar to an executive order, but with more power and worse implications, as it was more or less martial law whenever he wanted it. Any alarm bells going off here, folks? If yes, good. If no, maybe there's still some hope for you yet. He gladly threw the Freikorps and other military elements at the numerous coup attempts, except for the Kapbusch, which was done by the military and other monarchist sympathizers. This, however, failed as the public opinion of them was poor. He was able to keep things mostly not on fire until he died in office in 1925 because he had issues with frequent stress and being held up in court because of his enemies, which led him to missing many medical treatments for his appendicitis, and he died of septic shock. So now we have an issue. A new president had to be elected. So who does a citizen of a country that has lived under a monarchy for its recent past and the Holy Roman Empire for its not-so-recent past elect? If you answered a true Republican, you'd be wrong. 
Paul von Hindenburg, the hero of Tannenberg, a former general known for his feats in World War I, was elected in 1925 as well-remembered war hero among the lights of August von Mackensen. Did I mention he was 77 when elected? That won't cause any issues, I'm sure of it. Although a monarchist who was very skeptic of democracy, he did his job well, remaining faithful to republicanism. He was helped along by Streisemann, who kept doing his thing of maintaining the country until October 29, where he changed his mind and instead chose to die from his disease. Within two weeks, the stock market had crashed and the Great Depression started revving up and the US companies who had until now been investing in Germany pulled out and headed for the hills, barrel suit and tow. With the mass employment came mass unrest and the citizens started to riot and blame the current government. Because what else would they do? Cue the communists and fascists rubbing their hands together in expectation. So now the citizens started voting in these radicals and the government couldn't stop them. As one problem with the Weimar Republic was that it was too democratic at times. As the constitution did not allow for the banning of parties or any really rules regarding them at all. There was also the mess of forming coalitions and the numerous parties, including two SPDs and two communist factions. Now the Chancellor had the issue of the opposition, who flip-flopped to either side depending on the bill, making it hard to get anything done. This all came to head when the SPD and various centrist parties made a coalition and it imploded due to the stock market crash. Hindenburg decided to flip the table and dissolve the parliament for elections. He was not a big fan of the SPD in his past, as they were kind of always the pain in the ass in the Reichstag for the more Prussian mindset set of people. So the election is held, and guess who got the major holdings in Parliament? The Communists and the Nazis. This completely ruining any hope for a good coalition among the Republican Democratic parties. This led Hindenburg to f flip the table in a different direction and have a minority cabinet and hammer out laws with Article 48, which would be repealed almost immediately after by Parliament. So our democracy continued on with the general displeasure from the people. So to get anything done, he forms the coalition and damns them all, the conservatives and the Nazi party, with Adolf Hitler as chancellor. Then the old bastard goes and dies, and Hitler merges the roles of president and chancellor into one and calls it Fuhrer. The Reichstag was still in effect, but it was more of an act at that point, and we all know what goes on from here, so let's go over a few things. Things not to do to establish a good republic. Force it immediately on an undemocratic nation. Give the ruler... not define what a party is and what is allowed and not allowed, shuffle up the government and get nothing done, and elect undemocratic leaders democratically. So now let's take a trip back to ancient Rome in the late 2nd century BC. Rome has just conquered Carthage, gaining Iberia and much of the Maghreb coast. Through other conquests they have conquered Illyria and much of Greece and the Balkans. These feats were done by Rome's citizen army, who self-funded their way into service, as it was considered a great honor to fight for your country. Rome's economy swelled through the influx of slaves from the conquered peoples. This meant that the organization of the economy changed too. Small family-owned farms were outcompeted by upper-class slave plantations and proceeded to go bankrupt. The wars Rome was fighting were no longer contained to the Italian peninsula, which meant the citizen army that went out to war could not tend for their fields and result in massive losses of money for them. The only way these Romans could get by was to sell their farms to the upper-class slave plantations. This meant that the class difference between the upper and what we call middle class was immense. Most of these displaced farmers would try to make it in Rome itself, looking for jobs and not finding anything of substance. This led to the working class's displeasure to fester, and you can guess where this is going. If you said communist revolution, you'd be wrong, but would be a bit on the right track. Two brothers, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, were born into this world. The children of Tiberius Gracchus the Elder, who was a consul of the Republic twice, and had even received a triumph of his own, in Cornelia Africana, the daughter of Scipio Africanus. Yes, that same Scipio Africanus who defeated Hannibal and grew to loathe the Republic that he had fought so hard for due to its treatment of him. Ingrata patria ne osa quidem habeis. Ungrateful fatherland, you will not even have my bones. They were given a Greek education and learned the ways of political science and war. So let's start with Tiberius, who was only in his teens when his father died. He devoted himself to the Republic by first becoming a tribune. Being a good Roman, Tiberius marched off with his half-brother, Scipio Aemilianus, 
to finally finish Carthage for good. Through this war and his half-brother, he became known as a brave and courageous young Roman, an elected quaestor. He was then thrown into the Numantian Wars to conquer Iberia for Rome. The man he served under, Gaius Mancinus, became infamous for his repeated defeats during the war. One night, during an ambush, the legion was slaughtered and Mancinus ordered a surrender. As if his night wasn't getting any worse, the Numantians refused to discuss anything with Mancinus. They would only negotiate with Tiberius. This was most likely due to the actions of their father, who had also fought in the Numantian Wars, and was fair to them in their treaties. Tiberius was able to negotiate for 20,000 Roman soldiers and all of their attendants from being enslaved or worse. At the end of the long march home, it was Vietnam BC edition. The upper classes admonished him that he would sacrifice Rome's glory just to save his own skin. The people, however, especially those whose sons had served with him, thanked him for keeping the soldiers safe. This came in handy, along with Scipio lending a hand, as when it came to a vote of what would happen to the officers, Tiberius included, they were granted clemency. Only our old friend Mancinus would be turned over to the Numantians, naked and in chains. He would not be accepted by them, however, and returned home as a member of the Senate, until he had his citizenship revoked due to his surrender. Now Tiberius turned his attention elsewhere, to the upper-class slave plantations. After he was elected tribune of the plebes, his main wish was to return the enforcement of the law that stated that no man may own more than 500 acres of public land, so that the people may reap the rewards of war, not just the bourgeois upper-class patricians. He put in law that the rich plantation owners simply turn over the land they illegally owned, after being compensated by the state. The wild beasts that roam over Italy, he would say, have every one of them a cave or lair to lurk in. But the men who fought and die for Italy enjoy the common air and light, indeed, but nothing else. Houseless and homeless, they wander about their wives and children. It is with lying lips that their imperators exhort the soldiers in their battles to defend sepulchres and shrines from the enemy. For not a man of them has a hereditary altar, not one of all these many Romans an ancestral tomb, and they fight and die to support others in wealth and luxury, and though they are styled masters of the world, they have not a single clod of earth that is their own. Understandably, this did not sit well with the fattest of the fat cats, and they accused him of attempting to start a populist revolt. Funny you should mention that. They used their vast influence and power to influence the poor into siding against Tiberius, but it was no use as the people were not that dumb to believe them. So his law passed, until it was vetoed by the Tribune, and it went stillborn. Perhaps out of frustration, he tried again and got vetoed and decided to filibuster the ancient way. Vetoing every single law attempting to be passed, and blocked the removal of money from the treasury. This started a plot to kill this consul who acted like a dictator. Wait, what? This gaming of the system pointed out a major flaw in the Republic, that they allowed absolute power backed up by what was more or less the honor system. This should be a good time to talk about Tiberius' other goal, overturning the last election. You see, if your opponent is gone, then there is no more deadlock in the Senate. Because of this opposition, Tiberius decided it would be best to remove Octavius from office. Now, just because Tiberius Gracchus' vote to determine whether or not Octavius should be removed from office was successful in the sense that it was decided in Tiberius' favor, things were about to change for the worst for him, however. Once Marcus Octavius was removed from office, the plebeian tribunes came together and reached a decision that the veto of Tiberius' programs and land reform should be nulled. Once this was over, they dragged Octavius down and the crowd pounced on him, which he escaped, but one of his servants had his eyes removed from his skull. The downfall of Octavius did not sit well with many and sparked the downfall of Tiberius himself. The consul had created many enemies and critics because of his heavy-handed, at-all-cost approaches to democracy. During the same year, the king of Pergamum, Attalus III, died and left his kingdom to Rome in his will. While this might seem odd, it was kind of a brilliant move on his part as it prevented a civil war over succession of his kingdom and uh, an inevitable war with Rome. Tiberius pounced on this and used the wealth and land to fund and execute his new law, bypassing the Senate entirely who would normally be in control of matters like these. This turned most of the senators against him, and speech after speech berating this would-be king was given in the Senate. There was even one instance when one senator gave such a harsh speech that Tiberius demanded his seizure and to be brought in front of the people. The senator simply stated, 
If thou wish to insult or degrade me, and I invoke the aid of one of thy colleagues in office, and he mounts the rostra to speak in my defense, and thou fly into a passion, come, wilt thou deprive that colleague of his office? This was a jab at the removal of Octavius, as Tiberius appeared to be creating a cult of personality around himself. This speech caused such an effect on the people that a wary Tiberius dismissed the assembly and let the senator go. After one of his friends and supporters died, Tiberius went with the idea that he was poisoned to win sympathy with the people. His whole family dressed up in funerary garb in front of the assembly to win favor with the masses. Now paranoid that once he lost his sacrosanct position of tribune, he would be killed, Tiberius pleaded to be re-elected. He made some outrageous claims to get re-elected. Some things never change. A fight broke out on election day as some of Tiberius' supporters were blocking people from voting as it seemed it was not in the le their leader's favor, and voting had to be closed for the day. A senator, Fulvius Flaccus, warned Tiberius that a faction was plotting to kill him. This caused the closest of his supporters to arm themselves and prepare for an attack. Those farther away were confused and wished to know what was going on. Here Tiberius made a fatal error. He pointed to his head to signal that people were going to kill him. One of the many confused took this as Tiberius requesting to be crowned and told the Senate. The consul said he would veto any attempt for a king to rise, but this was not enough for the crowd as Nasia proclaimed. Since then, the chief magistrate betrays the state. Do ye who wish to succor the laws follow me? With these words, he covered his head with his skirt of his toga and set out for the capital. All the senators who followed him wrapped their togas about their left arms and pushed aside those who stood in their path, no man opposing them, in view of their dignity, but all taking to flight and trampling upon one another. Tiberius attempted to flee, but tripped, and as he strove to rise to his feet, he received his first blow, as everybody admits, from Publius Satieris, one of his colleagues, who smacked him on the head with the leg of a bench. The second blow was by Lucius Rufus, who plumbed himself upon it as if some noble deed. At the end, three hundred were slain by blows from sticks and stones, but not a single by a sword. Those who died with him had their bodies thrown in the Tiber, including Tiberius, into the river by which he was named. This was the first and definitely not the last act of sectarian violence the public had ever seen. So, what have we seen here? Unchecked power will be abused eventually. Relying on the honor system will not suffice. Good acts done through corrupt means is not a true good act, and once a taboo is broken, it cannot be fixed. As one could understand, Gaius did not take this very well. Up until now, Gaius has taken more of a backseat and remained in Tiberius' shadow, working on the land commission under his brother. He was a quaestor himself, but in Sardinia. From an oratory standpoint, Gaius was quite different from his brother. Speeches were filled with gusto and emotion versus Tiberius' calm, official reasoning. This was such an issue that Gaius had a slave stand behind him during speeches with a harp, and was ordered to play a note to remind him to calm down any time he got into such a fervor that he was red in the face, bellowing from the depths of his lungs at the crowd. These oratory skills stroke fear into the senators, wary of another Gracchi with powerful words. This came to a head during one cold winter in Sardinia, where the soldiers stationed there were freezing to death and Gaius was able to procure clothes by appealing to the residents of the island. This sent alarm bells in the Senate. They hatched a plan. Since a quaestor always had to be with his proconsul, they would simply extend his proconsul's term. Gaius, being a Gracchi, said, nuts, and decided to leave the first chance he got. He was then brought in front of censors to stand trial as to why he abandoned his post, but he swayed the crowd in his favor and was let go. He also served two or more years than he needed to. Accusations came his way again when he was supposedly aiding a revolt in Phrygia. With little evidence to support this, he went free. He came upon the decision to run for tribune, because what could possibly go wrong? In the elections, he came in fourth with ten positions open and immediately started pursuing forms like his brother, including the judiciary system, learning from his brother's fate. He would use his brother in much the same way Stalin used Lenin, elevating him upon high and legitimizing his actions. These reforms were used as payback to get at Populius Laenaeus, who banished or executed many of Tiberius' supporters during his time in office. Populus did not dare be tried and fled Italy entirely and went into exile. Taking a close look into the reforms he did, he continued his brother's reforms, appealing to the rural communities to help shake up the voting base for senatorial elections. He also introduced the professional armies which would come back to bite the Republic and later empire in the behind years later. 
Getting back at the Senate, he proposed using the middle class for judges, a position normally held by senators. He also granted suffrage to all Italians, not just Romans. During a famine, he capped the price of grain, making the state buy grain and sell it at a loss to people, a precursor to the grain dole of the empire. Due to a slow election cycle where the three elected tribunes had to pick the other seven, Gaius got elected without even running. Everything was not hunky-dory, however, as when Gaius attempted to start new colonies so that the poor overcrowding Rome could have a nicer new life, the Senate shot him down, and then proposed starting several more colonies instead. This cycle would continue every time he tried something. Then to further curb his powers, the projects the man started would always be put into place by someone other than himself as to limit his influence. When a measure was passed to found a colony at Carthage, which had been destroyed in 146 BC by Scipio Africanus the Younger, Gaius was appointed to oversee the construction and left for Africa. The Senate immediately took advantage of Gaius's absence by attacking Gaius's ally, Fulvius Flaccus, who was known by the Senate to be an agitator and was suspected by some of stirring up the Italian allies to revolt. When he finally returned to Rome, he was met with a horrible scene. The people had been turned against him. They now opposed allowing citizenship for all Italians outside of Italy. Now Livius was their man. He then decided to live amongst the poor, to gain some favor, and learn of issues straight from the epicenter. But many of the reforms he suggested were already enacted. The Senate convinced Fanius, whose friendship with Gaius had run its course, to expel all those who were not Roman citizens by birth from the city. Gaius condemned the proposal, promising support for the Italians. But his image took a hit when he failed to uphold his promises and did not stop the authorities from dragging away a friend. Whether he did this because he was afraid to test his power or because he refused to do anything, which would give the Senate a pretext to initiate violence upon him, remains up to speculation. One thing he would do, though, is to remove the upper-class seats from the gladiatorial coliseum, which blocked the poor's vision of the family-friendly violence. Truly a man of the people. Then it was election time again, and Gaius won the run for a third term, something unheard of until now. Through hard work, effort, and using his charm of the people, he lost. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. Using his oratory skills, he cried out to the people that The process is rigged. This whole election is being rigged. He did not find much support, and the Senate began the process of repealing his reforms one by one. When the time to repeal laws came, Gaius showed up with a mob. Then someone in the senator's camp told one of Gaius' supporters to stand aside. He was promptly stabbed to death. Yeah, that's right, folks. It's time for Bloodbath 2, Senatorial Boogaloo. Gaius tried defending himself and denouncing the murder, but it was too late, and the Senate pounced. The following morning, Fulvius' men armed themselves with spoils from Fulvius' Gallic campaign and marched loudly to the Aventine Hill. Gaius refused to gird himself with anything save a small dagger and his toga. As he left his home, his wife Licinia, daughter of Crassus, begged him not to go to meet the same men who had murdered and dishonored Tiberius Gracchus, knowing well enough that Gaius was to die that day. Gaius, without saying a word, gently pried himself from her arms and left her there, weeping until her servants eventually came to pick her up and carried her to her brother Crassus. Gathered on Aventine Hill, the two sides met. At Gaius's suggestion, Fulvius Flaccus sent his youngest son Quintius to negotiate a peace between the two factions, but was sent back. When Quintius returned to Gaius and Fulvius, Gaius was willing to acquiesce to their demands, but Fulvius was not and sent the boy back. After rejecting the peace, the senatorial archers started the fire on the crowd and it dispersed. Fulvius and his son fled, but were caught and executed. Gaius, however, taking no part in the fighting and lamenting the bloodshed, fled to the Temple of Diana on the Aventine, where he intended to commit suicide but was stopped by his friends. Gaius knelt and prayed to the goddess, asking that the people of Rome be forever enslaved by their masters since many had openly and quickly switched sides when the amnesty was declared by the Senate. Gaius fled the temple and tried to cross the Tiber on a wooden bridge while Pompinius and Licinius stayed behind to cover his retreat, killing as many as they could until they themselves were felled. Accompanied by his only slave, Philocrates, Gaius fled, urged by onlookers that no man offer assistance despite Gaius's repeated requests for aid. Arriving at a grove sacred to Furina, Philocrates first assisted Gaius in his suicide before taking his own life. Though some rumors held that Philocrates was only killed after he refused to let go of his master's body. 
His corpse was decapitated, and there was a reward for its weight in gold. Funnily enough, the person who turned in the head hollowed it out and filled it with lead to get a better reward. It was rejected. His body was thrown into the Tiber, suffering the same fate as his brother. The brothers exploited the democracy to benefit the people, and by doing so, damn said democracy. They inadvertently brought violence into politics that would stay long after the Republic fell. The actions of these brothers would then be inadvertently reenacted by Gaius Julius Caesar, and with his death, so died the Republic. I hope you all learned how to destroy a democracy from the inside today, and I wish you the best efforts with your Republic. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. Big thanks to Plutarch, who basically wrote this script for me.